Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. It is not clear when or even if Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu will deliver on his pledge to annex a major chunk of the occupied West Bank. Even less clear is how the Palestinians will respond if that happens. Well, my guest today is the Palestinian ambassador here in London, Hussam Zumlot. Does the Palestinian leadership have the vision, the imagination and the credibility to mount an effective response? Hussam Zumlot, welcome to Hard Talk. You Palestinians were preparing on July 1st to hear the announcement from the Israeli government that they were going ahead with the annexation of a major chunk of the West Bank. It hasn't happened. Do you have any reason to believe it won't happen? No, I don't have any reason so far to believe it won't happen. The calculus with Netanyahu, the calculus in Israel is still the same. The net gain for uh, this government is clear. For Netanyahu, it's simply uh, a way of reassuring his re-elections, uh, his control of the system, uh, dodging criminal charges, and he's been achieving that. Also, it serves as a key strategic uh, uh, function, which is destroying the two-state solution. And he's been public about it since he was elected first time in 1996. He's hostile to the very uh, idea of a sovereign, independent Palestinian state. And it serves a political function, a distraction. I mean, everybody now is up in arms about annexation, when in, when in fact annexation is only one of the many acts that has been undermining the peace efforts. Everybody is up in arms about uh, uh, him stopping annexation, when in fact the discussion should be on ending occupation. So now he's comfortable. And uh, therefore, the world did not produce sufficient consequences for Netanyahu to stop annexation. Yeah, you've just given me an answer which dug deep into the politics, as you see it, of Mr. Netanyahu and the Israeli government. What you didn't give any sense of there, but I wonder if you appreciate it, is the degree to which for Netanyahu and for his government, this isn't just a matter of politics. It is a matter of who they believe the Jewish people are and what fundamental rights based on law, history and even the Bible rights that they have and have a right to pursue. Can you imagine a world where such a premise would be the base of our international relations? Can you imagine a world where uh, 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 issues of land and territory and sovereignty has to do with myths and explanations and emotions and feelings? Do you accept the Romans to come back and say we have a claim on the, White, uh, on the Isle of Wight here in the UK because they started there? The, do, you, do you really want to revisit the whole notion of a rules-based international system? Why did we establish the United Nations? Because of the horrors of the Second World War. Because what we did to each other. So, so because because, on, because of the never again. The, so the, we the, decided the, to establish I just, rules. I, I just, I, I, the rhetoric I, I've heard before, I just want to know whether when, for example, Danny Danon, the outgoing UN ambassador for Israel, when he says to me, as he did just the other day, when he said, we cannot annex what is already ours. When you hear people representing the government of Israel say things like that, do you, is there any room for dialogue? No, no, and that's what we have been saying. You see, there are two ways to look at this situation. Either a political legal way, which we, the Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, the rest of the world have been seeing, defining Israel's occupation of the 1967 areas is a military occupation. It is temporary. The international law applies. Israel must seize that occupation. That's the political legal. And hence we entered in various peace processes to find only mechanisms to backroll that occupation. The second way to look at it is that, biblical, religious, but let Israel be reminded that 6.7 million Israeli Jews are defining it as Jewish land, okay, out of biblical claims. They forget that they, they live in between 1.2 billion Muslims who define the entire historic land of Palestine as an Islamic waqf. That Jerusalem was the first Qibla, the direction of prayer for all these Muslims. They forget that billions of Christians also have claimed on the land, and therefore you're talking about the Armageddon. You're not talking about peace processes. You're talking about the war of gods. So people like Danny Danon 
are dangerous. The fact is, though, Ambassador, that Danny Danon and others close to Mr. Netanyahu can espouse their belief of the legitimacy of what the international community calls annexation because you, Palestinians, time and time again over the last few decades have rejected peace plans which would have given you so much more than you can possibly imagine getting today. It's your rejectionism that has landed you in this place. How on earth have we rejected anything? I mean, the only thing we Do have... Do you want me to list no, all no, of the different no, no, moments, no, 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 the different no, peace no, plans, no, 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 when no, the Palestinians no, no, have rejected no, and no, walked away no, no, from essentially getting 95, 97 no, percent of what they wanted in terms of occupied land? You know, uh, uh, prison guards need only 2 percent of the prison area to control the lives of the prisoners. And this is exactly every single peace offer that, was, that came our way over the last 30 years. Today marks the uh, 41st anniversary of the first visit of Yasser Arafat to Europe. It was to Vienna in 1979, in July. He met the chancellor there, then Bruno Kreisky, and the engagement started the pressure by Europe and the international community to accept the PLO, accept the two-state solution. The argument was, should you align yourself with international legitimacy and law, you will get a state on the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital. And all of your historic issues, legitimate issues, like the issue of, uh, of refugees, will be resolved. That was the argument. So that was never, the two-state solution was never a Palestinian demand. It was a Palestinian concession to ally ourselves with international law. This moment is more about international system, international order, than it is about us. I think we have compromised enough. You were the Palestinian representative envoy in Washington until the Trump administration decided they didn't really want you around anymore. So here you sit as the Palestinian envoy in London. Therefore, you know better than me the realities of politics and diplomacy today. Donald Trump, with his peace plan, has in essence given a green light to Benjamin Netanyahu to complete this annexation policy. That is a reality that you cannot change. Yeah, but we can stand up for, and this is exactly why our office was shuttered and I was sent off, not because they didn't like me, but because we, the Palestinian people and the leadership, stood up, said, no, these are the contours, these are the rules, we will stick with it, and what you are doing is simply illegal. You cannot give a cover for Israel's illegal annexation. And uh, you know, uh, Stephen, sometimes in our situation, and you just said I was the ambassador to the US, I know I was in the crossfire. I know the sheer pressure on us, the Palestinian people and leadership, to stand up is not a small measure. But the fact is, I, I'm looking at all of the different European and Arab reactions to the Netanyahu annexation plan. They're all, of course, saying don't do it. And if you do do it, there will be serious consequences. Just to pluck one out of the air, Boris Johnson, I profoundly hope that the annexation does not go ahead. If it does, the UK will not recognize any changes to the 67 lines, except those agreed between both parties. You like all of that. But the bottom line, again, is that Washington is the place that counts. And you've just heard Secretary of State Mike Pompeo say that the U.S. administration no longer regards Jewish settlements in the West Bank as illegal. That, again, is the diplomatic reality. And we don't accept uh, that is a diplomatic Well, you may not reality. accept no, 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 it, no, no, but no, unless no, you have plans to somehow uh, okay. remove Donald Trump, Mike Pompeo, and the entire team, that's the diplomatic reality you live with. If, if you tell me that uh, Trump and Netanyahu decides, determines, defines international rules and international law, then we, we should find another discussion. That's not the United States behind Netanyahu. That's Trump and few four of his team in the, in the White House behind Netanyahu. We are also following the huge opposition in the U.S., in the Congress, in the Democratic Party, in the Jewish community, in the civil society, in the media, in the elites, in the think tanks. No, that's not the United States. That's one person. That is Trump. And yes, sometimes you cannot be offensive in your ideas and strategies. You have to be defensive. And sometimes you need to protect yourself, protect what you believe in, and ally with the people that you think 
will one day create a better chances. And yes, we agree with Mr. Johnson that the 1967 borders is the mark, that nothing should be recognized beyond it, that international rules are very clear. But we also would like to see more actions. And we have been saying this to the government here. Uh, Netanyahu will not listen out of just statements. He needs to know that there will be severe consequences and the state of Palestine needs to be recognized now because if you don't recognize it now, level the field, give hope about the two-state solution, then if you do that later, it might not really serve any purpose. Well, I want to come back to diplomatic moves later and the international scene, but I, for right now, I want to focus on what you Palestinians are going to do next. Let us assume, and the Israeli cabinet is suggesting it, the annexation plan hasn't been shelved, it may come to fruition in late July, we don't know yet, but if it comes to fruition, the Palestinian Authority, which you represent, seems to be suggesting that it will respond by cutting all funding, all support for its own activities across the piece, from security through health care, schooling, everything. It seems to be saying we will close down as a Palestinian Authority. We will not act as an agent of Israel in our own places. What is the point of this self-harm? It's a fundamental point. It's a point about definitions. Uh, this is not about self-harm or whatsoever. You're it right. seems perverse. No, 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 it is going to create you're, the you're, most almighty humanitarian you're, you're, crisis you're, for your own people. You are absolutely right that we should preserve and even you know, build more of our national institutions, improve our services, our delivery, our consultations and democratic process. But all this was meant, the Palestinian Authority was meant to take us from occupation to independence. That was the key function why we, with the international community, established the Palestinian Authority. Israel wants the Palestinian Authority to remain as a service provider under occupation to our people. And therefore, it serves Israel to maintain the status quo. And we know that we need national institutions. We need the Palestinian Authority. It does crucial functions in the health arena. Look at us today with the coronavirus pandemics. In the education arena, only two days ago, our high school certificates, and it's a pride. We have one of the highest PhD graduates worldwide. Yeah, but you're talking we, about we have, abandoning your we, own people. Yes, to quote but, but, Hussein al-Sheikh, the uh, official in charge of relations with Israel, he says if they go through with the annexation, then they can go back to being the occupying power throughout the whole West Bank. Israel cannot have the cake and betrayal of your own people. Israel cannot have the cake and eat it too. Our people want one thing: they want liberation, freedom, justice. They are seeking but do you think, do you ordinary think, life. Do you think your if, civil servants and your security and, personnel want their salaries and, to be cut? And, and 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 you know, not with bread, a human being only live. Uh, we live with dignity. Well, and, Ma and, Ambassador, you know, it's fairly and, easy and, for you to and, say and, that and, in a comfortable and, place here in London representing no, the Palestinian Authority. What about the tens by, of thousands by, by of people the, who will have no salary no, if the, the Palestinian no, Authority the, refuses no, to pay? The tens of thousands of people know that their issue is not economical. They know that they are not poor because of a natural disaster. They know that they live and own one of the most rich lands on earth. And by the way, before this all happened, before the foundation of Israel, we were one of the richest in the region, and we remain to be one of the richest in the region. And, and, this and is not an economic issue. Well, it's an economic this issue for lots is, and lots no, no, of people. No, what no, about the Gaza Strip, once, for example? Uh, yeah, the Palestinian uh, Authority may not care so much about because, the Gaza Strip, because, it's, it, of course, it's because, controlled by Hamas, not by Fatah. No, but the we truth care. is... I am a Gazan. I am a Gazan. And by the way, I so do not... So what do you I, say? I, when I Mr. Do not, I do not... I, I was born in Gaza to a refugee family, and we know exactly what has been happening in Gaza. It's primarily an Israeli blockade. Let's not have Hang on Israel. a minute. What, when, your colleague, when your here. colleague Hussein al-Sheikh says that they are going to slash the $105 million that the Palestinian Authority sends to Gaza each month to cover things like utility fees, medical fees, everything else, when he says he's going to slash that money because, on principle, he won't operate as an agent of Israel, how do you think the people of no, Gaza, no, no, with, no, no. With, with the 53% poverty rate, the 50% unemployment, are going to feel no, about no, I'm that? I'm sorry, you're misreading in this. Nothing will be slashed. And, uh, and the responsibility of the leadership on the people in Gaza, in Jerusalem, in the West Bank, in the refugee camp outside is solid and clear. It is our responsibility. You ask me that I represent the Palestinian Authority. I don't. I represent here the Palestine Liberation Organization. My office in London is called the PLO office. My office in Washington was the PLO. The Palestinian Authority has no diplomatic arms. The PLO remains to be the umbrella, the institution of the Palestinian people. The PLO shall continue being responsible on providing for our people in Gaza, in Jerusalem, in the West Bank and everywhere else outside in the refugee camps. The issue is about the Palestinian
Palestinian Authority as an institution that was meant to last for five years from 1994 to 1999 as per the agreements we signed with Israel, as per the commitment of Israel. That five-year period was meant to build the capacity of that Palestinian Authority to become a full-fledged state. In these 27 years since we last signed the Oslo agreements, Israel has made mo mockery of all these agreements. The other thing that has been said by officials in the PA is that they will end all security cooperation with the Israelis. We now, have already ended. You've already ended yes. it. So yes. we are now talking about chaos. We're talking about insecurity which could spiral out of control. Is it that you want a new intifada? No, this is not what we want. What we want is enough status quo. Enough 27 years of Israel simply, we are tired. We are sick and tired, Stephen, of telling everybody that Israel is disingenuous. It's not serious. With every brick it has built since 1993 after signing the peace agreements, and look at it now. We started the peace accords with less than 125,000 settlers. Today we're talking about 750,000 settlers, and the extremist government in Israel are talking about a plan of one million in less than two years. But what do you think, hang so on, what do you think will happen when you tired. withdraw all, all security cooperation with Israel? You said you've already done it. The UN envoy in the Middle East says that he fears that there will be a trigger, conflict and instability will spread across the occupied West Bank and in Gaza too. I put it to you again, is that what you want? No, uh, what we want is what uh, the representative of the UN wants. We want uh, accountability. We want the, the implementation of international re resolutions. We, we want justice for uh, the, 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 the young man in Jerusalem who was uh, killed last month, uh, uh, Al-Hallaq autistic Palestinian and this morning, just this morning, his family was told by the Israeli authorities in Jerusalem that the cameras around were not functioning. They requested a copy of the cameras. You know why? Because they wanted to shield the killers. Uh, Stephen, we decided to stop coordination. We uh, uh, announced that we are absolved of all agreements for two reasons. The first. Israel has nullified all agreements the moment it has announced in its own government formation from the far right to the left, from the settler movement through the Likud to Labour, that they will illegally annex occupied territories. They nullified all the agreements we signed. It's over, so we cannot okay. continue committing to these agreements. So here, here's where I have a profound problem with your position. You say it's all over. You say there is nobody to talk to in Israel. And yet, at the very same time, your only strategic offer appears to be to get Mr. Netanyahu to reverse course on the annexation. And then you say, according to your senior officials who've just put this in writing, you want to go back to the negotiating table. You want the so-called quartet, the international powers, to become involved and resume a negotiating process, which you've just said to me in the course of this interview has got you precisely nowhere over the last 27 years. What kind of a strategic vision is that? Well, if, for anybody who wants to see an implementation of the two-state solution, here you go, three things. First, we need a framework, and that framework has got to be the international framework. That's why we came to the peace process. And by the way, this whole international resolutions was a pressure by Israel. Israel wanted a two-state solution but you, in the 70s With respect, and you, the you say you want to go need, back and have the international community need, involved, but Donald Trump, you've said in highly personal comments, has blown up the entire peace process. He's killed Oslo. You've accused him of the, the most heinous political crimes, and now you say you want the quartet, which of course involves the United States, to oversee new negotiations with Mr. Netanyahu. It, it seems to me, and I dare say to many Palestinians, that your strategy doesn't make sense. You see, our strategy, we had a strategy. The strategy was two states based on international legitimacy and that the world will come, will guarantee it, we will move to it. That strategy has failed because of Israel. Let me quote you the key line from the Palestinian Authority message to the quartet that was released just a few days ago. We Palestinians, it says, are ready to resume direct bilateral negotiations where they stopped in 2014. That means after everything you've said to me about Mr. Netanyahu, about his motives, about what he's done, about what Israel is doing to the Palestinian people, you are simply prepared to go back and resume negotiations. Your own people are going to say, what on earth is the point? Who are you kidding? No, if, if, if international framework is the reference, if there is a multilateral mechanism for mediation, not the US, the US has been discredited, and should this process has a timeline, 
I believe this is to our interest. We are oriented towards a solution. We are not fatalists, Stephen. We are the ones who are losing our kids by the day with no accountability. We are the nation that is losing its land by the day. Yes, of course we want a solution, but not any solution. There is at the heart of the Palestinian leadership, and I'm quoting Hani al-Masri here, the head of the Maserat think tank in Ramallah, a sense that the leadership is working in a haphazard way without a clear strategy. That's what it looks like. Seriously, you, you, we just blame the victim all the time. And but this think, is a Palestinian well, and, and saying and this. I can quote you other Palestinians. Diana Butu, a we, former we, member we of think, the negotiating think, yeah, C yeah, team, yeah, says that, it's that a, the Palestinians yeah. are acting it's, like they have no legitimate counter-proposals to put to what, an end what this counter, Israeli our occupation. What counter-proposals? We have made the biggest counter-proposal in our history. It took us so many years, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, to come to terms with with the counter proposal that was brought to us by the world that we must accept a state on 22 percent of our land and you know what this annexation thing is an opportunity actually it serves some useful functions to revisit everything we have done and it's going to take us time from the Balfour declaration of the UK in 1917 promising a Jewish homeland in Palestine and at the time Jews own two percent to the partition plan of 1947 offering uh, Israel 55% uh, when in fact they own 70% and it took us so long to accept the two-state solution. Don't ex accept or expect us to come up with a strategy instantly. What, Di need, what Diana Bhutto is need, getting to We is need the, to is consult our people, not, not, not this figure or that figure. Well, we need to go Let back in a democratic process and tell our people, here you go. Here we are and let's go together to a new destination. Do you still believe in this tired old phrase, the two-state solution? I, I don't think Israel is interested in any solution, be it one state or two well, states. With and state, I previous, ask you whether you, you believe you, in a two-state solution. I, I believe that a two-state solution on the 1967 borders would have provided a beginning for addressing the real issues of see, see, Pat, equity, what, what, equity, justice, and a different interaction between the two sides. Yes, I considered ending Israel's occupation, establishing a sovereign state to be a milestone in our journey as two communities to actually build a different future. Polling across the Palestinian territories so shows support for the two-state solution at its lowest since uh, surveys began around the time of the Oslo Accords in 1993. Huge numbers of Gazans in particular have left and left for good it seems 35,000 last year went through Egypt and didn't return 150 young doctors in Gaza appear to have left and made new lives overseas it looks like young Palestinians in particular have lost faith in the notion that there ever can be this two-state solution can you blame them? I mean, they are there. They see everything on the ground. They see the encroachment of the settlements around their houses. They see the unabated colonial exercise that is intending not only to take over the land, but to replace the people, the Palestinian people. You can't blame them. But this whole thing, one state, two state, Stephen, is a distraction. It's a distraction. The reality is we are still under military occupation. The reality is we are still under colonial expansion that is not seeing us as part of the land. We are still besieged in Gaza. You know, during the coronavirus, we tried to distribute food in East Jerusalem. We have 350,000 residents, Palestinians. And anybody who would voluntarily distribute food would be arrested by Israel. This is the reality. The reality is grave injustice. We need to think about how do we stop these injustices. I now care less as a person about the form of the solution. I want these grave injustices that have lasted for a hundred years to stop. Hussam Zumlot, we have to end there. Thank you very much for being on Hard Talk.